Hello, and welcome to the debut episode of the Canadian Portfolio Manager podcast, where we help you better understand and manage your ETF portfolio. I'm your host, Justin Bender. For over a decade, I've been assisting our PWL clients and do-it-yourself investors with their index portfolios. I also write articles on ETF investing over at CanadianPortfolioManagerBlog.com and create investing tutorials on the Canadian Portfolio Manager YouTube channel. So please feel free to check those out after the show. In today's episode, we'll be discussing the popular Vanguard Asset Allocation ETFs, which have recently blown past the $2 billion mark in assets under management. The demand for simple, low-cost, and diversified investment solutions has been around for many years, so kudos to Vanguard for finally making these products a reality. Do-it-yourself investors can now purchase these one-ticket ETFs with the click of a mouse, or about the same amount of effort it takes to pay a phone bill online. This is good news for the majority of investors who prefer to spend as little time as possible managing their portfolio. I'd say in a given week, I probably only do about 15 minutes of real, actual work. Vanguard now offers five flavors of these asset allocation ETFs. The Vanguard Conservative Income ETF Portfolio, VCIP, which allocates 80% to bonds and 20% to stocks. The Vanguard Conservative ETF Portfolio, VCNS, which allocates 60% to bonds and 40% to stocks. The Vanguard Balanced ETF Portfolio, VBAL, which allocates 40% to bonds and 60% to stocks. The Vanguard Growth ETF Portfolio, VGRO, which allocates 20% to bonds and 80% to stocks. And finally, the Vanguard All Equity ETF Portfolio, VEQT, with a 100% stock allocation. Throughout the show, I'll likely hit you with even more acronyms and investment jargon, so I do apologize in advance for this. Allocation, asset mix, attribution analysis, these are just terms I throw around all the time. Before we get started, I'd like to thank all the CPM blog readers who took the time to email me their voice recordings. These questions will form the foundation of the show, so please continue to send me your recordings and topic ideas for future episodes. With that said, let's kick things off by helping you choose which Vanguard Asset Allocation ETF is right for you. Well, I've narrowed your choices down to five unthinkable options. Each will cause untold misery. I pick number three. Selecting which Vanguard Asset Allocation ETF to purchase can be intimidating especially if you ask friends, family, or colleagues what they think you should do. You'll probably not only receive conflicting recommendations, each one will be sure they're right, even if it's a much riskier and aggressive asset mix than you'd select on your own. Remember, it's not their money at risk. My advice on seeking advice is to ignore what your peers are doing with their money. You're the one who should decide how much risk makes sense for you. Fortunately, I've got three rational determinants to help you figure this out. They are your ability, willingness, and need to take risk. To determine your own risk tolerance, completing an investor questionnaire is a good way to get the ball rolling. Vanguard Canada has provided a decent online form, which I've linked to in the Model Portfolio section of the Canadian Portfolio Manager blog. It includes 11 questions to help you consider your personal risk profile, as well as your investment circumstances. Before you proceed, let's look at each component involved. Your ability to take risk depends on your investment time horizon and the stability of your income or human capital. If you have many years to invest in a stable income flow, you should be able to take more risk. We should be honest here. We have no income flow, no incoming income flow. We have plenty of outgoing income. For example, if you're 30 years from retirement or a tenured professor with a pension, you have the ability to invest in an asset allocation ETF with a higher stock allocation. On the other hand, if you're a few years from retirement or working less reliable freelance jobs, you may want to consider an asset allocation ETF with a higher bond allocation. Although Vanguard's questionnaire is a good starting point, it's not without its issues. For example, the first few questions relate to when you'll need your money back. If you indicate that you plan to withdraw your money in two years or less, but you answer the remaining questions as aggressively as possible, the suggested asset mix will be 50% stocks and 50% bonds, which is way too risky for an investment horizon of under two years. As a general rule of thumb, You shouldn't invest in any of these ETFs if you require the cash back in less than five years. I recently analyzed hypothetical Vanguard Asset Allocation ETF performance over the past 20 years ending June 2019, and here's what I found. The worst one- and two-year periods were negative for all five ETFs. The worst three-year period was negative for all ETFs except the Conservative Income ETF, VCIP, which holds 80% in bonds. Even still... VCIP only returned 1%. The worst four-year period was negative for all ETFs except VCIP and the conservative ETF portfolio, VCNS. 
but these only return 2.2% and 0.2% respectively. For investment horizons of five or more years, these asset allocation ETFs could be appropriate for you, but you still need to line up your investment horizon with the right ETF. For example, if you need the cash in five to nine years, VCIP and VCNS should be the only Vanguard asset allocation ETFs on your radar. Even the balanced ETF portfolio, VBAL, which allocates 60% to stocks, returned only 0.3% over its worst nine-year period. If you won't need the cash for 10 to 14 years, VBAL could be an appropriate choice, as even its worst 10-year return during this period was around 2%. If you don't need the cash for 15 to 19 years, you could look at a more aggressive ETF, like the growth ETF portfolio, VGRO. And if you're investing for 20 years or more, and you're comfortable dialing up your portfolio risk to 11, the all-equity ETF portfolio, VEQT, might be right up your alley. If we need that extra push over the cliff, you know what we do? Uh, put it up to 11. 11, exactly. Now, just because you have the ability to take risk doesn't mean you're willing to remain level-headed during a severe market downturn. Even if you know you have 20-plus years before you require the funds, can you keep your cool when your ETF's value plummets, which it most certainly will from time to time? That's right! We can't have anyone freak out out there, okay? We've got to keep our composure. We've come too far. There's too much to lose. We've got to just keep our composure. There are five questions in Vanguard's investor questionnaire that address your willingness to take risk. But when I completed them to be as conservative as possible, while still indicating a high ability to take risk, the suggested asset mix was 60% stocks and 40% bonds. This is probably too aggressive if you have a low tolerance for staying put during stock market declines. To estimate your willingness to take risk, I suggest imagining what you'd do if the stock allocation in your portfolio dropped by 50%. While any ETF investment could theoretically drop to zero, I guess, this should be a reasonable worst case percentage decline to consider. So if you're considering Vigro with an 80% stock allocation, assume the fund's total value could drop by 40% in a severe market downturn. Now take the dollar amount of your portfolio and visualize it dropping by 40% immediately after investing the cash. If you have $10,000, it drops to $6,000. If you have $100,000, it drops to $60,000. Would you really be willing to ride out that roller coaster, or would you feel like you just made a huge mistake? I've made a huge mistake. Be honest. Are those temporary setbacks going to completely freak you out? Go through the same process with other Vanguard asset allocation ETFs until you've identified one you can stomach. By going more conservative, you may leave some extra returns on the table over time. But in my opinion, that's a fair trade-off for avoiding the incredibly expensive mistake of trying to flee to a more conservative ETF, or worse, cash, in the middle of a market panic, when you'd be forced to sell your holdings at a deep loss. For this reason, I believe your willingness to take risk should always take priority over your ability to take risk. The final consideration is how much risk you need to take. Could you meet all your financial goals by simply investing in guaranteed investment certificates? If so, you may not need to put your savings at higher risk by allocating any of it to stocks. I'm not an investor. People always tell me, you should have your money working for you. I decided I'll do the work. I'm going to let the money relax. If you're a young investor and not offspring of the rich and famous, you can probably assume you do need to take some market risk, which means you can mostly ignore this component for now. As you build a more substantial portfolio, you can work with a financial planner to determine whether you can afford to take less risk over time. Before we move on to the next topic, I'd like to re-emphasize the relationship between your willingness and ability to take on risk, and how your willingness should probably be the one driving the bus, especially when you're still gaining investment experience. Do you have any experience? No, sir, I have no experience, but I'm a big fan of money. I like it. I use it. I have a little. I keep it in a jar on top of my refrigerator. I'd like to put more in that jar. That's where you come in. As a young investor, you may often hear that time is on your side, so you can go more aggressive with riskier investments. If we're talking about your ability to take on risk, this is true. But if you only have a modest amount to invest, think about how excruciating it'll be when the stock markets plummet, taking your seed money along for the ride. Until you've personally had the chance to ride out some up and down markets, I would suggest opting for a more conservative or balanced ETF rather than a growth-oriented or 100% equity ETF. There's nothing wrong with starting off with a more conservative asset allocation ETF, even if you're very young, have a long-term time horizon, and a stable income. 
I've yet to meet an investor who failed to meet their financial goals because they invested in a balanced asset allocation rather than a more aggressive one. So don't feel like you need to fake a high risk tolerance to fit in. You can go with a more conservative or balanced asset allocation ETF to start and use all your youthful energy to embark on a highly aggressive savings plan. This is likely to literally pay more dividends over the long term. It sounds like a get rich quick scheme. Yes, thank you. You will get rich quick. We all will. Keep in mind, if your portfolio size is modest, say $10,000, you're not giving up much dollar return by investing in a more balanced portfolio. For example, a 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio like VBEL has an expected return that is only around 1.6 percentage points less than a 100% equity portfolio like VEQT. On a $10,000 holding, this is only about $160 per year. As you gain more experience, you can always decide to sell your VBAL holdings and repurchase VGRO or VEQT. Hopefully you're now feeling more confident about choosing the right asset allocation ETF for you. Okay, I pick three. Try again. One. Go higher. Five. Too high. Three. You already said three. Six. There is no six. Two. Double it. Four. As you wish, sir. Before you run off to place your trades, let's do a quick reality check on what returns you can expect from these Vanguard asset allocation ETFs. Hi Justin, this is Mark H. from Edmonton. PWL Capital recently published a white paper on how to estimate future stock and bond returns. Using the same methodology, what are the expected returns for the Vanguard asset allocation ETFs in terms of both the expected premium above inflation and the expected return including inflation? Hi Mark. Thanks for sending in your question, which I'm certain will appeal to many listeners. I hope you won't mind. When collecting the data, I've strayed slightly from the PWL methodology by referring to online resources anyone can access. This will allow investors to recreate their expected portfolio returns whenever they please by following these six steps. Step one, estimate future inflation. For this figure, we'll head to the Bank of Canada website where we can compare the yield of a long-term Government of Canada notional bond, which includes an inflation expectation, with the yield of a real return bond of similar maturity, which excludes inflation. The difference between these two figures provides us with the market's ballpark estimate of future inflation. Similar to the PWL white paper, we'll remove any short-term yield discrepancies by using the 24-month average of the yield difference between them. As of June 28, 2019, the average difference or long-term inflation expectation was around 1.6%. Boring. Now that we have our future inflation expectation, we'll estimate Canadian and global stock market returns over the next 10 to 15 years. Step 2. Estimate future Canadian and global stock market returns. Forecasting long-term stock returns is a bit of a mugs game. Vanguard published a paper in 2012 where they examined 15 metrics to determine whether any of them had the ability to predict future stock returns. They found the most predictive power in valuation metrics, such as the price to earnings or PE ratios, but they were only meaningful over long time horizons. And even then, the PE ratios only explain the variation in real stock returns about 40% of the time. They've done studies, you know, 60% of the time it works every time. That doesn't make sense. The best valuation metric examined in the study was a cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio also known as the Schiller-Cape Ratio. It was named after Nobel laureate and Yale professor of economics, Robert Schiller. The Cape Ratio takes the stock's current value and divides it by the average inflation-adjusted company earnings over the previous 10 years. A 10-year period is used to ensure that profits are averaged over more than one earnings cycle, and the inflation adjustment ensures that company profits are still comparable even during periods of high inflation. Boring. Lucky for us, Star Capital publishes monthly global CAPE ratios online for various equity regions, so I've used these CAPE figures for our analysis. We can obtain an earnings yield for any given stock market by taking the inverse of its CAPE ratio, which just means dividing one by the CAPE. This can be thought of as a stock market's expected real return. As these are real return expectations, we'll still need to add in our 1.6% inflation expectation so that they're comparable to the notional returns reported on your investment account statements. As of June 28, 2019, the Canadian stock market had a CAPE of 21.5. Dividing one by the CAPE gives us an expected real return of 4.7% or an expected nominal return of 6.3% after adding in our 1.6% expected inflation. The global stock market has a CAPE of 23.4. Dividing one by the CAPE gives us an expected real return of 4.3% or an expected nominal return of 5.9% after adding in our 1.6% expected inflation. So Canadian stocks are expected to return 6.3% over the next 10 to 15 years, 
and global stocks are expected to return 5.9%. If these figures seem low to you, remember they come after a decade of incredible performance, when global stock markets returned an annual average of 12% in Canadian dollars. It's also interesting to note that the U.S. stock market has an even higher CAPE of 299 indicating low future real and nominal annual expected returns of only 3.3% and 4.9% respectively. This is no surprise, as the U.S. stock markets have been on a tear for the past 10 years, delivering an annual average return of 16% in Canadian dollars. While you shouldn't use these lower future expected returns to engage in market timing, they could further justify a generally sound approach to diversifying your equity holdings beyond just the U.S. Step 3. Estimate future Canadian bond returns. If lower future expected stock market returns have got you down, prepare to be even more disappointed with your bonds. For the Canadian bond portion of the Vanguard Asset Allocation ETFs, the underlying bond's average yield to maturity is our best estimate. This average sits at a meager 2.1% as of the end of June 2019. Step 4. Estimate future currency hedged global bond returns. The Vanguard Asset Allocation ETFs also include currency-hedged foreign bonds, and it's a bit more complicated to estimate their expected returns. If we simply use their current yield to maturity, U.S. bonds would be expected to return 2.5%, and international bonds would be expected to return only 0.7%. But currency-hedged global bond ETFs are also expected to provide what's called a hedge return, which is the return from their currency hedging strategies. This hedge return can be either positive or negative. That's boring. You're boring, everybody. Quit boring, everyone. Fortunately, I've already done the heavy lifting on that calculation in a recent blog post. Once the additional returns are factored in, global bonds currently have an adjusted yield to maturity of around 1.9%. If you no longer had this data moving forward, you could get away with just assuming the currency hedge global bonds are expected to return about the same as Canadian bonds, or currently around 2.1%. Step 5. Estimate foreign withholding taxes. Whether you invest within a TFSA, RSP, or taxable account, your Vanguard Asset Allocation ETF will be subject to foreign withholding taxes, creating an additional drag on your returns. When you hold your ETF in a taxable account, you'll receive a T3 slip at tax time, indicating the amount of foreign tax that you've already paid. This acts as an IOU from the tax collector, which is a good thing. That's as good as money, sir. Those are IOUs. Go ahead and add it up. Every cent's accounted for. Unfortunately, when you hold your ETF in a TFSA or RSP, you receive no T3 slip, so the foreign withholding taxes you've paid are lost forever. 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 In TFSA and RSP accounts, the annual tax drags are lower for the more conservative ETFs. They range from as low as 0.13% for the Vanguard Conservative Income ETF Portfolio, VSIP, to as high as 0.25% for the Vanguard All Equity ETF Portfolio, VEQT. If you're interested in estimating the foreign withholding tax drag of each asset allocation ETF, you can download the CPM Foreign Withholding Tax Calculator, available on the Canadian Portfolio Manager blog. Once you add in the 0.25% MER for Vanguard's asset allocation ETFs, annual costs increase in the range of 0.38% for the most conservative asset allocation ETF to around 0.5% for the most aggressive. Step 6. Weight the asset class returns. After we adjust each asset class return for its weight within the asset allocation ETFs, and we decrease them by their product fees and foreign withholding taxes, we end up with the following expected nominal return figures. Drum roll, please. 2.4% for the Vanguard Conservative Income ETF Portfolio, VCIP. 3.2% for the Vanguard Conservative ETF Portfolio, VCNS. 3.9% for the Vanguard Balanced ETF Portfolio, VBAL, 4.7% for the Vanguard Growth ETF Portfolio, VGRO, and only 5.5% for the Vanguard All Equity ETF Portfolio, VEQT. The real returns after inflation are even less exciting, ranging from 0.8% for the most conservative ETF to 3.9% for the 100% equity ETF. All this said, the future is uncertain, highly uncertain. It's important to keep that in mind when considering expected returns, even over the long term. Over the next 10 to 15 years, actual returns on these asset allocation ETFs and any other investments could vary widely from our rough estimates. Perhaps the key takeaway from all these calculations is that even with an all equity portfolio, 
you're probably best off if you don't expect years and years of double-digit returns going forward. At the same time, we've enjoyed a solid ride for the past decade, which may or may not last for a while longer, but I wouldn't bank on it. So you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah! So in the face of eternal uncertainty about what the future has in store, the wise investor builds an efficient, globally diversified portfolio that reflects their personal long-term goals and reasonable expectations about what markets have to offer. Then they sit tight for the ride. By now, you may have a better idea of which Vanguard asset allocation ETF you'd like to invest in. But Vanguard isn't the only provider of these one-ticket solutions. Many of Vanguard's competitors have already launched their own suite of asset allocation ETFs. So how can you decide which product to go with? Well, sometimes they just need to battle it out for your investment dollars. Like in our first ever... ETF Combat. Where we pit two ETFs against one another to test their might. In today's showdown, the Vanguard Growth ETF Portfolio, VGrow, will face off with the iShares Core Growth ETF Portfolio, XGrow. Although both asset allocation ETFs instantly provide investors with a globally diversified portfolio, there can be only one winner in this. ETF Combat. Round 1. Fight! XGrow was originally called the iShares Balanced Growth Core Portfolio Index ETF, with ticker symbol CBN. In its final year, CBN had a combined MER and trading expense ratio of 0.91%, which was an absolute joke. In January 2018, Vanguard came to the rescue by launching three passively managed low-cost asset allocation ETFs with annual costs of only 0.25%. The following year, they rounded out their offering with two additional asset allocation ETFs. iShares quickly followed suit. They changed CBN's ETF ticker to XGrow, which was pretty unoriginal. They also changed the fund's investment objective to a more passive strategy and reduced the MER to around 0.21%. This reaction by ETF providers to reduce their costs in order to compete against Vanguard has been dubbed the Vanguard Effect. An investor should give credit where credit's due. Vanguard's fund will conquer this first round because without VGrow, there would be no XGrow. VGrow wins. Round two, fight. Many index investors will focus on a fund's MER when choosing their asset allocation ETFs, which is definitely one of the many useful factors to consider. As mentioned in our first round, XGrow has an expected MER of 0.21%, while VGrow's MER is slightly higher, at 0.25%. For modest-sized portfolios, the difference in fees has little impact. For example, the fees on a $10,000 investment in VGrow would cost about $4 more per year than the same investment in XGrow, or about the cost of a Starbucks latte. However, for larger portfolios, this small cost difference can translate into hundreds of dollars each year. Because of its lower cost, we'll award this round to XGrow, the current champion of low fees. XGrow wins round three, fight. When Vanguard launched their asset allocation ETFs, they chose to allocate 30% of the stock allocation to Canadian equities and 70% to foreign equities, which are then weighted according to their global market cap. They also decided to allocate 60% of the bond allocation to Canadian bonds and 40% to currency hedged foreign bonds, which are then also weighted according to their global market cap. Shortly after the launch, Vanguard released a white paper discussing the rationale behind their portfolio construction decisions, which struck me as very thoughtful and transparent. When iShares launched their asset allocation ETFs, they were very similar in composition to Vanguard's ETFs, but with a hint of performance chasing. iShares had reduced the Canadian equity allocation from 30% to 25%. They also overweighted US stocks within the foreign equity allocation while underweighting emerging market stocks relative to their global market cap weights at the time. Finish it. With the release of their asset allocation ETFs, Vanguard has once again proven itself to be a true advocate for investors. Although this battle is over, there may be a rematch in the near future. VGrow wins. Frugality. My next question comes from a blog reader, Jean-Francois. JF posted his message on the blog instead of recording it, but with text-to-speech technology, this shouldn't be a problem. Hi, Justin. I hope you're well. Thank you for this opportunity. I don't own an iPhone, and I'm too lazy to search how to record and send a recorded message on Android. Anyway, my question would be, 
Why does Vanguard have a 30% weighting to Canadian stocks in its asset allocation ETFs, even though Canadian companies make up only around 3% of the global stock market? Thanks for your question, Jean-Francois. I've been asked the same thing countless times over the past five years, which again isn't surprising since foreign stocks have outperformed Canadian stocks by over 6% each year for the past little while. Canada sucks! In financial lingo, this overweighting is known as home bias. I'm certain other investors have also wondered about the overweight to Canadian stocks in most asset allocation ETFs, as well as in the Canadian Portfolio Manager and Canadian Couch Potato Model ETF portfolios. First off, no one knows the optimal future mix between Canadian and foreign stocks. I don't know, and neither does Vanguard, BMO, or iShares. Also, a comfortable split for one investor may cause another to abandon their investment plan when things get bumpy, so there's no right allocation for everyone. Let's review five reasons why a 30% weight to Canadian equities could be a reasonable choice for investors relative to a 3% global market cap weight. This should at least leave you with data for making a more informed decision for your own portfolio. The first reason is because overweighting Canadian stocks, at least up to a point, has historically lowered portfolio risk. I've crunched the numbers from January 1980 to June 30, 2019, and found the lowest risk growth portfolio was split 25% to Canadian stocks and 75% to foreign stocks. Yeah. Well, better make it 75. Okay. This is similar to how iShares and BMO weight their asset allocation growth ETFs, XGrow and ZGrow. This minimum risk portfolio had an average volatility of 10.39% over the measurement period. In comparison, the average volatility for a portfolio split 3% to Canadian stocks and 97% to foreign stocks was noticeably higher at 10.62%. Now, even though a 25% equity allocation to Canadian stocks resulted in the lowest risk for a growth portfolio over this time period, the precise overweighting didn't seem as critical. Consider the average volatility for a portfolio with a 30% or even a 33% equity allocation to Canadian stocks over the same period. They were all within a few basis points of one another. For example, a 30% equity weighting to Canada, which is how Vanguard weights Vigro, had an average volatility of 10.4%, or just 0.01% more than a growth portfolio with a 25% equity allocation to Canadian stocks. Likewise, a 33% equity allocation to Canada, which is similar to our Canadian Couch Potato and Canadian Portfolio Manager model ETF portfolio weightings, increased the average volatility by just three basis points to around 10.42%. All of these figures are within spitting distance of one another, so they could also be considered optimal from a historical risk perspective, and they all had much less risk than a growth portfolio invested entirely in Canadian stocks, which had a volatility of 12.82%. Based on these results, I think it's safe to say that Canadian investors should consider allocating at least half of their equity allocation to foreign equities, and probably more, while at the same time recognizing that they can have too much of a good thing. The second reason to consider allocating 30% of your equities to Canadian stocks is because at this level, your portfolio's weight in the top four sectors is minimized. The Canadian stock market is overexposed to four sectors, financials, energy, materials, and industrials. These sectors make up a whopping 75% of our domestic stock market, so you really can't blame investors for wanting less Canada in their portfolios. They say it's because I'm overweight. Overweight? You? Oh, now nah, that's crazy. As we include more foreign stocks into a Canadian-heavy portfolio, the total weight of the top four sectors continues to decrease until bottoming out at around 54 to 55%. This occurs when the split between Canadian and foreign stocks is 30% and 70% respectively. Even if we continue to move to a global market cap-weighted approach by adding more foreign stocks and reducing Canadian stocks to around 3%, the grand total of the top four sector weights barely budge. This is because the energy and material sectors just get swapped out for more companies in the information technology and healthcare sectors. Now, if you have a preference for these hipper drug and tech companies, maybe a global market cap-weighted portfolio is for you. However, know that you're still getting decent sector diversification with only a 70% weighting to foreign stocks. A third reason for allocating about 30% of your equities to Canadian stocks is because the single security risk in your portfolio is largely mitigated at this level. The total weight of the top 10 stocks in Vanguard's Canadian Equity ETF currently accounts for nearly 40% of the fund, with four of the big five banks accounting for around half of this weight. By splitting your equities into 30% Canadian stocks and 70% foreign stocks, 
the total weight of the largest 10 stocks in your portfolio drops to around 13%. Sure, you could reduce this figure to about 10% if you were to allocate only 3% to Canadian stocks and 97% to foreign stocks, but a 30% Canadian equity weighting already provides substantial single security diversification relative to holding only Canadian stocks. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. A fourth reason to have more Canadian equities in your portfolio is because Canadian dividends are extremely tax efficient relative to the dividend income distributed by foreign equities. In 2018, a top-rate taxpayer in Ontario would have saved over $18 in taxes if they had invested $10,000 in Vanguard's Canadian equity ETF rather than in a collection of Vanguard's foreign equity ETFs. However, the tax savings are not equal across provinces. A top-rate taxpayer in Newfoundland and Labrador would have less incentive to overweight Canada in their portfolio, as the tax benefit was only around $5 last year. On the other hand, a top-rate taxpayer in New Brunswick may have even more reason for a Canadian-heavy portfolio, as their tax savings was around $32 in 2018. Regardless of your income level or home province, most taxable investors across Canada can justify overweighting their stock portfolio with Canadian stocks beyond the 3% global market cap. Unfortunately, if you're not a taxable investor and all your investments are in TFSAs and RSPs, you still have to worry about withholding taxes on your foreign dividends. For Vanguard's 100% equity ETF, the tax drag is around 0.25% each year, or about $25 on a $10,000 investment. If Vanguard had opted for a global market cap weighting, this foreign withholding tax drag would have increased to 0.34% per year, or about 0.09% more than its current setup. Just remember, the higher the foreign equity allocation in your asset allocation ETF, the higher the foreign dividend withholding tax drag in your TFSA and RSP accounts. Fifth and finally, we should consider our own behavioral biases, especially recency bias, or our tendency to assume recent performance is going to last forever. When I started at PWL over a decade ago, investors hated U.S. stocks. I would hear things like, the U.S. stock market is dead, and why don't I invest more in Canadian stocks? That was behavioral bias at work. Over the decade 1999 to 2008, Canadian stocks had outperformed U.S. stocks by 9% per year on average. U.S. stocks actually lost almost 4% each year on average in Canadian dollars over that truly lost decade. It's no wonder everyone wanted to dump their losing U.S. stocks and load up on our winning Canadian ones. Many of you probably remember what happened over the next 10 years. U.S. stocks roared back to life. They returned over 14% on average each year, outperforming Canadian stocks by 6.5% annually. Once again, behavioral bias caused many investors to change their tune. Oh no! We suck again! I'm certainly not trying to predict which stock market will outperform over the next decade. I just want to bring some unbiased perspective to your decision making. If you want to invest in a global market cap weighting for reasons that have absolutely nothing to do with recent stock market performance, and you promise to stick with it, even if Canadian stocks significantly outperform foreign stocks over the next 10 years, I think that's fine. But if you're comfortable with the four other benefits I just described for overweighting Canadian stocks within your stock portfolio, the simplicity of a one fund portfolio seems worth a compromise. If you're still not sold on the benefits of a simple one fund solution, you're not alone. Even personal finance experts can question their strategy from time to time. Hey Justin, it's Rob Engen from the Boomer and Echo blog. My question to you is about the cost savings of using US listed ETFs. Right now, 100% of my portfolio is in Vanguard's All Equity Fund, VEQT. There's about 200,000 in my RSP and 50,000 in my TFSA. At what point would you say to me, Rob, look, you're absolutely crazy not to break up with your one ticket fund and switch to a portfolio that includes US listed ETFs. Ah, uh, you're crazy. Am I? Or am I so sane that you just blew your mind? In other words, when it comes to portfolio value, when does math trump simplicity? Hey Rob, thanks for your question. Let me start off by saying congratulations on a perfectly sane investment choice. Regardless of portfolio size, there's absolutely nothing wrong with sticking with a one fund solution like the Vanguard All Equity ETF Portfolio, VEQT. This is especially true in your TFSA. If you sold VEQT and repurchased a two ETF portfolio, which included a Canadian equity ETF and a US listed global equity ETF, you would only save about 0.04% per year, or just $20 on a $50,000 TFSA. So I think we can both agree that VEQT can continue to hang out in your TFSA. 
In the meantime, let's focus on the larger VEQT holding in your RSP. Math aside, I would maintain that most do-it-yourself investors would be wise to stick like glue to their one fund solutions, even as their RSP values continue to grow. Managing a portfolio of asset allocation ETFs will probably take up less than 15 minutes weekly of your precious time and mental energy, leaving you with more quality time to spend with family and friends. I think you'll agree, it's hard to put a price on that convenience. And even if you switch to and perfectly execute a two ETF portfolio, there's no guarantee you'll be in a better financial position down the road. That said, there is a point at which you're likely to end up leaving some money on the table by opting for simplicity. If that just doesn't sit right with you, and you'd still like to know when the numbers might start penciling out in your favor, I feel that an annual cost savings buffer of at least $500, or once your RSP exceeds $160,000, seems reasonable to offset some of the strategy's risks. Since your RSP value has already passed this theoretical threshold, a lower cost two ticket portfolio could be worth the hassle, at least if you're accounting for it in dollar amounts. By swapping out VEQT for a Canadian equity and US listed global equity ETF combo in your RSP, you can save about 0.31% per year in product cost and foreign withholding taxes. On a $200,000 RSP, this amounts to around $620 of savings each year. Dollar, dollar, bills, y'all. Sounds like a pretty sweet deal, but this assumes no cost to implement and manage your more complex portfolio. Before you start trading, let's review some of the potential implementation costs of this strategy, along with tips to help you avoid any huge mistakes. I'll refer to TD Direct Investing throughout these discussions, as I understand TD is the brokerage you currently use. To keep things simple, I'll also assume your new two ETF portfolio would consist of the Vanguard FTSE Canada All Cap Index ETF, VCN, and the US listed Vanguard Total World Stock ETF, VT. First, if you're purchasing US listed ETFs, you'll need US dollars. A do-it-yourself brokers like TD Direct Investing will be more than happy to exchange your loonies for dollars, but they'll insist on getting a piece of the action. But since you're converting a large amount, you should be able to get a decent rate. When I recently called TD to inquire, their quoted FX rate would have cost you around $650. It would take slightly over a year for your annual savings to offset this upfront currency conversion cost. Still, it's not a bad deal, since you'll likely be reaping big cost savings over an investing lifetime. So as I was saying, the amount of money I'm going to be making would hurt your parents' feelings. Some savvy investors will correctly note that using Norbert's Gambit, a strategy that allows you to cheaply convert your loonies to dollars, would significantly reduce your conversion costs. In this example, the Gambit would have cost about $300, or less than half the cost of accepting TD's FX rate. If you want to learn more about Norbert's Gambit, please check out my YouTube tutorial for step-by-step -step instructions on how to use the Horizon's US dollar currency ETFs, DLR and DLR.U, to perform the gambit at various discount brokerages. Unfortunately, at TD Direct Investing, they take a few days to process your RSP gambit transactions. This leaves you underexposed to global equities, as you haven't purchased VT with your US dollars yet, and overexposed to the US dollar, as you now hold DLR, which holds US dollar cash and equivalents. If global stocks go down during this holding period, you win. If they go up, you lose. And if the US dollar appreciates or depreciates against the Canadian dollar during the same time period, this will also have an impact on your returns. These potential opportunity costs can be substantial. For example, if you sold $200,000 of VEQT on August 14th, 2019, and had to wait until August 19th to buy your US list global equity ETF, you would have missed out on net market gains of around $3,900. In this unfortunate scenario, the future savings from switching from VEQT to a two-fund portfolio will take over six years to make up for the initial cost of this unlucky Norbert's Gambit transaction. I've got to do something to get my money back quickly. This calls for an aggressive trading strategy. If you're seriously considering breaking up with VEQT, you may also want to consider breaking up with TD beforehand. There are other discount brokerages like RBC Direct Investing and BMO Investor Line, which allow you to implement the entire Norbert Gambit process in your RSP on the same trading day, leaving you less vulnerable to these market timing issues. A second cost to consider when making the switch are the bid-ask spreads. When trading ETFs, you buy at the ask price and sell at the bid price. The difference in the two prices is another hidden cost of switching from a one fund to a two fund solution. Think of your ETF as a bar of soap. The more you touch it, the smaller it gets. Although this exact cost is impossible to calculate, you can get a decent estimate by multiplying the number of VEQT shares you own by about two cents. 
So if you initially held 7,500 shares of VEQT, I would estimate a total bid-ask spread cost of around $150. A third cost is trading commissions, both during the initial implementation and on an ongoing basis, as you attempt to keep your two ETF portfolio in balance. On such a large RSP, these $10 trading commissions are hardly worth mentioning, but for more modest-sized RSPs, investors should certainly pay attention to this cost. And finally, there's the unknown cost of your new portfolio's tracking error relative to VEQT. This cost can be either positive or negative. You would expect your new portfolio to have positive tracking error due to lower product fees and foreign withholding taxes. However, this could be offset by a number of factors, such as timing differences and portfolio rebalancing. Vanguard plans to run a tight ship, rebalancing whenever any underlying ETF becomes overweight or underweight by more than 2% of its target. As their asset allocation ETFs are extremely popular with investors, they also have plenty of new daily cash flows they can use to rebalance the portfolio more frequently. The frequency of your portfolio rebalancing will no doubt differ from Vanguard's, so expect slight differences in returns going forward. You'll also experience different performance between yours and VEQT's foreign equity stock holdings. While they're very close, VT's and VEQT's underlying foreign equity exposures are not identical. I'll be interested to learn which option you decide to go with, Rob. I don't think either is universally right or wrong. If you've made it this far, I hope I've given you a good sense of which one is right for you. All right, that concludes our very first Canadian Portfolio Manager podcast. Thanks for listening. We're going to create a new episode every month or so, so please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast service so you never miss an episode. In the meantime, feel free to check out my blog at CanadianPortfolioManagerBlog.com. I'm Justin Bender. Talk with you soon.